Mr. Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to the bill currently being debated, the Firearms Amendment Bill 2017. Mr. Speaker, I have spent quite a bit of time preparing for the debate on this particular piece of legislation. I've looked at, Mr. Speaker, various historical data. I've looked at various facts, Mr. Speaker. And I think for the most part, Mr. Speaker, I'm well prepared to add my own support to this debate, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, however, as I listen to my colleagues on this side, as they presented, I came to the conclusion that there is really no need for me, Mr. Speaker, to repeat what has already been well said and well established by my colleagues. I can speak, Mr. Speaker, to the moderate under this administration, under the former administration, uh, but as I said, Mr. Speaker, that has been well established. I can speak, Mr. Speaker, to several different programs which this administration has put in place to deal with the crime situation, Mr. Speaker. I've heard those from the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, who have stated uh, that this particular piece of legislation appears to be the government's answer to the crime situation here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Basically, Mr. Speaker, ignoring all that the government has done. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that you have three branches of government. You have the legislative, and so you come to the parliament, Mr. Speaker, to pass legislation. You have the executive branch, Mr. Speaker, and you have heard of various policies you have heard of various programs being put in place, Mr. Speaker, by the executive branch to deal with the crime situation. Mr. Speaker, and of course, you have the judicial branch, which at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, has to, the option to exercise this particular piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. But even apart from this particular piece of legislation, you have heard the mover of the bill, Mr. Speaker, for example, in his own remarks, pointed to the fact that even at the judicial level, we have gone so far, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that you have an additional judge being stationed here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. Speaker, I say all of that to basically say that I don't think there is any need for me to go that particular route. As I stand here and as I contemplated my own presentation to this debate, it has crossed my mind, Mr. Speaker, that perhaps more than anyone else, Mr. Speaker, in this honorable house, when it comes to gun violence, Mr. Speaker, I can speak from a personal level, Mr. Speaker. And so it is from that personal level I will make my contribution to this debate. Today is the 14th of June, and it was just a little over three months ago, on the 9th of March, at approximately after 3 a.m. in the morning, I was at home, in my bed, sleeping. I was awakened by the sound of five gunshots. I got out of my bed and I journeyed into the living room area upstairs of the house where I occupied. I looked through my kitchen window, looked down the road, didn't see anyone, didn't see anything. 
As a matter of fact, at that point in time, it didn't even cross my mind is that some of those gunshots were actually fired at my own home. As I stood at the top of the stairs, my mother, my father, the two other occupants of the house went towards the living room and the downstairs. And it was only when my mother said she is certain that she heard glass shattered that I looked at a window upstairs immediately right over the stairway and realized that there was a hole in one of the glass for the window. I immediately said to my parents to go in the back of the house and I went back to my bedroom, called 911, asked for the number for the Sandy Point, in indicated to them what had happened, asked for the number for the Sandy Point Police Station and called the Sandy Point Police Station and said to them uh, that uh, bullets, gunshots have been fired and for the most part, it appears as though those gunshots have been fired at my home. I stayed in my room, Mr. Speaker, until the police came on the scene. And it was only after the police came and in exiting the living room door on the upstairs, I recognized that a gunshot also came through the living room door. Some may ask why that wasn't immediately recognizable. But the living room door also has an inner screen door. And because of the color of that screen door, it was difficult at that point in time to recognize that a gunshot had come through the living room door, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I spoke to the police, yes. But as I reflect, Mr. Speaker, on what took place, circumstances, Mr. Speaker, could have been far different than they turned out. And indeed, I give God thanks, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. By the time I got downstairs, Mr. Speaker, and looked at my vehicle, I also recognized uh, that gunshots also had been fired at the vehicle and also at a window downstairs at, in the living room area downstairs. Mr. Speaker, I have uh, here a picture of a couch in my living room upstairs, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the gunshot which came through the living room door penetrated the couch in the living room and the armrest went through the entire armrest, Mr. Speaker, and lodged in the cushion itself, Mr. Speaker, the cushion itself, Mr. Speaker, for the chair, for that particular chair, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is a chair from time to time. I would lie down in, look at television. Persons would come, sit in that chair, look at television. Mr. Speaker, had circumstances been different and perhaps I had fell asleep in that chair or someone had been sleeping in that chair that morning, Mr. Speaker, that person would have been the victim, Mr. Speaker, of that particular gunshot which came through the living room, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the one that I referred to which came in through the window over the stairway, that one, Mr. Speaker, found itself
in the kitchen area, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this is a box of garbage bags that I keep on the counter in my kitchen. Right in front of that box, Mr. Speaker, just as I have here, had a case of water right next to it, Mr. Speaker. And so you have the box there on the counter. You have the bottle of water there, Mr. Speaker. And even after the police left my home that day, Mr. Speaker, if that bullet hadn't been discovered. It was the following morning I said, that bullet has to be someplace in the house. And I began looking, looking, looking. And discovered that the bullet grazed past the case of water and lodged itself right here where you see this hole in the garbage, in the box with the garbage bags, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, that could have ended differently. Had I gotten up at that point in time and journeyed to the kitchen, Mr. Speaker, to get a bottle of water, or even to go to the fridge, or to the sink, or to the kitchen, for whatever reason, Mr. Speaker, if that bullet could have hit me, or could have hit someone else, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm going through all of this because we are speaking about firearms, illegal guns. And sometimes when we speak, we don't speak having the intimate, the intimate, Mr. Speaker, knowledge, having come close, Mr. Speaker, to the reality of what can happen, Mr. Speaker, with firearms, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also have here with me the headrest from my vehicle. Because as I said, one of the bullets penetrated the windshield for the vehicle. That particular bullet, Mr. Speaker, ended up in the headrest on the driver's side for the vehicle, the headrest. Again, Mr. Speaker, had I been in the vehicle, had someone been in the vehicle, Mr. Speaker, we can only imagine what would have been the end result. That is my lived reality, Mr. Speaker. And having experienced that, Mr. Speaker, your life is never, ever the same again, Mr. Speaker. Shortly after the incident happened, I heard and I saw messages being circulated on social media He's saying that my house was shot at because I had criminal elements or persons involved in gang activity, family members of mine inside of my house, providing coverage, providing security for them, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I have a Bible here with me. And as I hold this Bible in my hand, I can swear on the Bible before God and man that that is an absolute lie. Right. Neither on that morning or any right. other day, or any other day, I had any such individual inside of my home, Mr. Speaker. And I say, right. I can do it, Mr. Speaker, because I'm doing it honestly. Honestly, I can swear on the Bible that that is an absolute lie, Mr. Speaker. An absolute lie. Yeah. An absolute lie, Mr. Speaker. No such person was in or ever been provided coverage in my home. And for those who still would want to believe otherwise, 
My mother was home. My father was in the house. And so they can verify that with them. And even, Mr. Speaker, even if that was the case, even if it was the case, Mr. Speaker, you had my mother in the house, my father in the house. So even if that was the thought by persons, Mr. Speaker, and so they feel somehow that I was guilty by association, Mr. Speaker, then what of the other innocent persons in the house, Mr. Speaker? What of other innocent persons? The bullet that hit the window downstairs, fortunately, it didn't penetrate because that particular window has burglar bars built into it. And so where it hit, it hit exactly where the burglar bar is built in. But he would have ended up in the living room downstairs. My father is normally, when you visit the house, in a chair right there, looking at TV, relaxing. He could have been there that particular morning, Mr. Speaker. He could have been there. That is the reality, Mr. Speaker. And so for me, Mr. Speaker, with a good and clear conscience, Mr. Speaker, I can come into this house and remain quiet relative to this particular piece of legislation. I cannot come in here and not support this particular piece of legislation. I have spoken about my own lived experience. But what of other persons out there who have actually been the victims of gunshot in terms of being hit, Mr. Speaker? What of those persons? I am certain, Mr. Speaker, that this legislation brings some level of comfort to those persons knowing that the penalty is to be increased, Mr. Speaker. I said to you that after having an experience like that, your life is never the same. Each time I am at home and I sit in my living room chair and see is that bullet hole because I can't afford to change the chairs yet, Mr. Speaker. Each time I see it, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to sit in the chair because there is always is that thinking within your mind. What if someone comes up the stairs again and does the very same thing? I don't think I'll ever be comfortable lying down in that chair and sleeping in that chair, Mr. Speaker, because of what would have happened. Each time you step out of your house, you're very alert. Each time I get home, I'm very alert. Because if that has been an experience, an experience that you'll never forget, one that up until this day, I can't understand. I'm not involved in any gang. I'm not involved in any illegal activity. I don't have any criminals in my house. I'm accustomed to be the type of person I walk the streets of saying it's free. Persons know me to be all over the place. You go in any community, or they there sitting down, talking to persons, relaxing. That is the life I'm accustomed to living. That incident has brought a different reality to my life, Mr. Speaker. I can speak for me, but having experienced it, I can only imagine what other families have gone through, what other individuals have gone through. The trauma that they have had to face.
the emotional trauma in my own case it has cost me money to repair my vehicle it has cost me money to make repairs to the home I had to replace it to those the window downstairs imagine those Mr. Speaker who have to spend much more whether it is for emergency services at the hospital to bury loved ones those who have to fly out Mr. Speaker those who are now disabled Mr. Speaker because they have been the victim of a gunshot Mr. Speaker imagine those persons put yourselves in the shoes of those persons Mr. Speaker this particular piece of legislation yes as I said it perhaps it brings some comfort but it can never give them that peace of mind that they had before those who have been left disabled it cannot fix the disabilities that it cannot fix the disabilities that they now have Mr. Speaker can't do that Mr. Speaker I understand there are those in here who said that I gave the items to the police well as far as I know driving my vehicle the vehicle has been repaired the headdress is still in the vehicle of course the police came they took the evidence and I'm happy that they did well I wonder if the police has the old door that they took off which is home in the back of my yard too when persons saying that I get texts to say I gave the items to the police what has also been helpful while I'm speaking about the police Mr. Speaker is I have cameras on my property I have cameras on my property and so I also understand the importance of cameras I understand the importance of it because of the very same cameras the police was helped in carrying out their own investigations Mr. Speaker for example we know that it was one individual as opposed to wondering if it was more than one person the police was able to look to see specifically where to find the shells because they were able to see the individual as the shots were fired the police has since come back Mr. Speaker and has done certain work which I will not speak to again because of having the cameras I also know Mr. Speaker that the firearm which was used in that particular incident has been recovered by the police I will not give any further details but the police was able to know it was that firearm because of the same piece of equipment costing over a hundred thousand dollars which this government Mr. Speaker invested in the very same microscope Mr. Speaker was used by the police to make that determination why is investment Mr. Speaker I'm speaking from personal experience no one has to tell me so I could speak to the use of the microscope I could speak about cameras but more importantly Mr. Speaker I can empathize with those persons Mr. Speaker who have been the victims of illegal firearms here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. Speaker, you have had much song and dance coming from the opposition side. As I said earlier, that the government isn't doing anything that this is the answer forthcoming from the government. We heard of the PEP program, how we have placed so many persons on the street. We have heard that it is not important, Mr. Speaker, to provide certification for persons. Mr. Speaker, 
I have a copy of the CDB report here. It is the CDB report which says that only 130 persons were provided training for. In this government to said it, Mr. Speaker, CDB, the Caribbean Development Bank, 114 females, 16 males. The very same report says a number of challenges have been experienced in the implementation of PEP. Trainees have been in the program for over two and a half years and have still not been certified. CDB said it. CDB said the persons haven't been certified. CDB recognizes the importance, Mr. Speaker, of certification. The speaker before me, he said, imagine him being a lawyer and no certificate to show. Imagine sitting in a classroom two and a half years and no certificate to show, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, certificate not important, member for number. apart from being here in St. Kitts and Nevis and having that certificate to show, we have free movement of people yes. within the region and within CARICOM. You have free movement of people for skilled persons, Mr. Speaker. Yes. You must have a certificate to show. CDQ. And I can't believe that that came from a former minister of education. Yes, it did. One who should be familiar. Uh, yes. His mother not before the court. No. Mr. Speaker, Your I continue. A3. So you have had the PEP, which has now been transformed into the STEP program. Okay. Apart from saying, Mr. Speaker, is that it's not important to certify persons. I've also heard the argument being made, Mr. Speaker, is that at a forum, a magistrate said is that the PEP program brought about a decrease in crime in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. The major thing which has been referred to is that Less persons were coming to court, Mr. Speaker, in respect of child support. That has been the major argument, Mr. Speaker, which has been proffered. Mr. Speaker, when you look at PEP... Again, for the part of Mr. Speaker, I was at the symposium. That's not what the magistrate said. It was not in reference to child support. Child support, yes. It was not in reference to child support. It was with reference to young ladies in particular whom she had seen coming before her for shoplifting. That is, that is what she said. That is what she said. She was making reference to a number of cases which she had seen coming before her pertaining in particular to young ladies and young men who were coming there for shop, shoplifting of small items. And after the PEP was introduced, she said clearly that those cases had seriously subsided. Okay. That is what she said. Thank you, Honorable Member. Continue. Number five. Mr. Speaker, that isn't what was said yesterday. Yeah. I listened. Yeah. And what was made reference to, Mr. Speaker, is child support. That is what was made reference to child support. But Mr. Speaker, the fact is that PEP began in December of 2012, Mr. Speaker. December 2012. And the members opposite, they have spent quite a bit of time speaking about the murder rate in particular. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, the murder rate went from 16 in 2012 to 21 in 2013 and from 21 in 2013 mr speaker to 24 in the year 2014 mr speaker that was there you get the impression from them 
uh, that Pep brought about this big change in terms of illegal activity, in terms of criminal activity here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, if that isn't reflected in the moderates, Mr. Speaker, not reflected, as a matter of fact, by the year 2013 and 2014, you would have had more persons on PEP than 2012 when it began. And the rate went up. The rate went up. That is the reality, Mr. Speaker. So persons shouldn't come in here and give the impression as if PEP caused this big decrease with violent crime here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. It didn't. It didn't. Mr. Speaker, if I go back to the point about training, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce was interviewed when the CDB was here. The Chamber, the private sector, Mr. Speaker, pointed to the fact that, and I read from page 21 of the report, it was noted that employers were not happy with the output from the training system. Not working. I repeat, it was noted that employers were not happy with the output from the training system. Many of the new entrants lack basic foundation skills, such as the requisite numeracy and literacy levels. They were not only lacking in the technical skill area, but in the soft skills required for the workplace. Reading and writing. The following paragraph. While many employers participated in the work experience program for the training system, it was recommended that a longer period of training take place on the job, such as an apprenticeship program. The representatives of the private sector mentioned that instructors themselves needed upgrading and training to remain current with the many changes technological in the industry. A criticism of the program, Mr. Yes. Speaker. From an, independent from an independent body. Yes. And they have we have reformed the program. They are arguing that we have reformed the program when the facts are there to clearly show that the program as is wasn't working. Sure. That is a fact. A fact that we cannot escape from the very same report says that instructors were not trained, neither were they exposed to TIVET or competency-based training, yet were asked to deliver competency-based programs. Is the same thing happening in this house right now? Those who have failed on the issue of crime yes. come in here to lecture us about crime and what to do. Very same point, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Persons delivering competency-based training but had no training in it. Those who have failed, it is what they are accustomed to coming here to tell us what to do to deal with the situation of crime. Those who took the moderate to the highest, the number one in the world, has come now to say, we had the answer to crime. Yes. Well, I don't know what they did with the answer when they had it. <laughs> I don't know what they did with it, Mr. Speaker, because the answer was obviously wrong. If they copied it, they copied the wrong answer. They said they have the answer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the report goes on in the appendix to speak about the very same PEP program. PEP, attrition and certification rates as output measures, it says not applicable, no graduates. Not applicable, no graduates awaiting certification. The next page, 
involvement of employers in development of instructional delivery materials, no evidence of that. No evidence. Develop a program to train persons. You would think, Mr. Speaker, that you are going to go out into the labor market, assess the conditions of the labor market, and having assessed the conditions of the labor market, you then put a training program in place to meet the needs of the labor market. That is a sensible approach. Indeed, that is a sensible approach. But that approach wasn't taken. You didn't have an attendance certificate. Not even an attendance certificate there, you're right. No completion certificate, no attendance certificate, no kind of certificate. Now, under the very same people on the program, put them in a position, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Because even them, Mr. Speaker, were no, disgusted program. with them. All they are in the they knew something was wrong. That's what they are in the <laughs> They knew something was wrong. And the producer booked you, know, Mr. Speaker, Pep. Blessing. Pep. Every page you turn, Pep is a blessing. <laughs> Pep is a blessing. Pep is a blessing. Pep is a blessing. Exactly. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, even come like they were laughing after the participants. And yes. you, you know when you said that, Mr. Speaker? Because I see a picture in here of the member from number two. And the picture says she was getting a haircut. <laughs> it says, reading from the own document. Mm -hmm. And the picture is captioned. Mm -hmm. Pep working miracles. <laughs> Light <laughs> moment as Pep cosmetology course facilitator. Miss Julia Queeley left, mocking the attempts to Mark cut me. Honorable Marcella Leibert's non-existent here. Yeah. <laughs> you understand the joke? Member from number two. Member from number, number, two. number two. See it here for yourself. Sure. Yes. Make a mockery of Making the people. Making a mockery of the people. A blessing. A mockery of the program. That's the four man here. That's the man with the four. Yeah. <laughs> mockery. <laughs> I'm not part of the program. Yeah. Young people we, we looking for hope opportunities. Hope. And hope. Looking for hope yeah. to Why upgrade not? their skills. Callousness. Looking for hope. Them, oh, they are unemployed. Looking for hope and finally when they think there's some glimmer of hope. A mockery is being made of them. Teaching them from modules already expired. Modules already expired. So you aren't even teaching them in terms of current practices. That is misfeed. Not current practices, but practices which have long passed, long gone, outdated. Teaching our young people. Backwards. 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 Whether you're in primary school, you're in high school, you expect that when you are taught that you can go out there and compete with anyone, yes. anywhere in the world, because you have received the best of an education. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're sitting down in a cosmetology class and you're probably being taught using some kind of outdated method when you have more modern methods available. And it's not Mr. Speaker that they didn't have the money. Because the member for number six boasted when he left government mm -hmm. that he left hundreds of millions of dollars in the treasury. And the police station run down. The Angels police station run down. Schools. They criticize this, 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 this CCTV program which we are now putting in. But prior to the change of this government, the cameras that they had installed, the majority of them were not working. They were on the lamppost just for style. Style and fashion. You see camera, you think camera working. When you check the camera, nothing on the camera. Nothing there for anyone to see. They also came in here, Mr. Speaker. They spoke about the REACH program. They also come in here, spoke about the REACH program. They said it's a program they had in place to help young persons and this government basically dismantled the REACH program, not providing for the young persons here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. Speaker, the fact is 
is that a committee was put in place to look at the REACH program and to come up with recommendations. The committee came back with recommendations and this is a broad-based committee, Mr. Speaker. We didn't sit down as a cabinet and decide we're going to get rid of the REACH program and this is what we're going to do instead. The committee members, 19 persons on the committee, I only lie but will it. The former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, Eleanor Phillip, senior assistant secretary in the Ministry of Education, she was a chairperson. The Lois Stapleton Harris, vice president, academic and student affairs, CFBC. Pamela Pemberton, director of the Navy Sixth Farm College. Grace Laplace, representative of UWE Open Campus. Cicely Jacobs, representative of UWE Open Campus. Clyde Christopher, director AVEC. Palsy Wilkin, the principal education officer for Nevis. Courtney Thompson, CEO TVET. Dwayne Mills, president of the Student Government Association of CFBC. So even students were involved in the process. Camille Wilkin, student rep, Nevis Sixth Farm College. Sahira David, youth officer. Tafrida Rochester, the Chief Personal Officer, Calvin Edwards, Deputy Financial Secretary, Donna Basu, the Coordinator for Self, Hugh Heiliger, who is in the gallery, Director of Institutional Development at CFBC, Celia Christopher, Director of Gender Affairs, Dennis Knight, Chair of the Education Advisory Board, and who was a former Personal Human Resource Manager at TDC, Maclo Taylor, a representative from the SIDF. They came up with the recommendations, Mr. Speaker. Not cabinet sat down and said, well, we feel this should change about the program and that should change. We depended on the advice of persons out there within the education system, persons out there within the private sector. We depended on them and based upon their recommendations, we made changes to the system. Anyone, whether at CFPC, AVEC, Navy Six Farm College, someone taking UE Level 1 program, free to apply, free to apply to get assistance from the program. And again, when you apply, the decision is not made by any individual here as to whether or not you are eligible. The Social Development Department looks at the applications and make the necessary recommendations. Not any member of cabinet. We are not trying to deny any young person the opportunity to get an education. The committee felt that there were certain abuses and certain recommendations were made to ensure that those abuses discontinue. The program is there and young people continue to benefit from what is now the SAFE program. Mr. Speaker, from time to time, you have heard me refer to the fact eh, that we are now in the process finally after some 18 to 20 years of having a federal youth policy. When those on the opposition benches speaking about young people criticizing young people. For 18 or so years, Mr. Speaker, they were working on a national federal youth policy. 18 years. 18 years. So concerned about what is happening with the young people, but not even a national youth policy was forthcoming from the former administration. We now have the draft, Mr. Speaker. And when you look at the draft federal youth policy, we recognize that there are a number of issues which must be addressed pertaining to young persons. One, not only to help with the crime situation, but with regards to the overall development and participation of young persons in the development of the Federation. You have in here, Mr. Speaker, economic participation. 
because we want young people to become entrepreneurs. Safety, security, and protection. Safety, security, and protection. Because we recognize there is an issue with crime. So this particular piece of legislation is only one facet in terms of what we are doing to deal with the crime situation in the Federation. You have education and lifelong learning. And part of the reason for that, Mr. Speaker, is we recognize we have a problem within our education system. And I will get to that when I speak to what we are doing within the Ministry of Education. Health and well-being. Youth as agents of democracy, development and national building. Youth and sustainable development. Youth development work and youth mainstreaming. And then, of course, you have a number of cross-cutting themes and concepts, Mr. Speaker. And to accompany this, Mr. Speaker, to accompany this, Mr. Speaker, of course, you will have the relevant strategy to ensure that what is enshrined in the youth policy actually comes to reality. Mr. Speaker, education. What are we doing in education? I have here the St. Kitts and Nevis Education Policy Review, final report, March 2016. We also recognize that education has a role to play in dealing with the crime situation. Be it at the primary level, be it at the secondary level, be it in terms of lifelong education. The reality, is, Mr. Speaker, is that only about 65 to 70 percent of persons who enter high school graduate from high school. And there is, there is the recognition that we need to increase the percentage of persons graduating from our secondary schools. In particular, the percentage of young men who drop out of secondary school, we need to decrease it. The ministry has embarked and will be embarking on several different programs to help to bring that situation to the level that we would be comfortable with. The TIVA program, the government has invested through a loan from CDB some $20 million for our TIVET program. It is not that the government wanted to go further into debt, but there has been the general recognition that this TIVET is an important part of the education, of the development of our young people. And so the government has decided to make the investment $20 million from CDB for TVET programs here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Different aspects of the program to be implemented at different high schools at AVEC. You're supposed to have buildings being built in Nevis to accommodate the program in some cases so that whether you're teaching the program in St. Kitts or Nevis, you have a state-of-the-art building so that all students can partake in the lesson. AVEC, almost every week, every month we have meetings because they're supposed to be an amalgamation of AVEC, Project Strong and Youth Skills. And your building is supposed to be erected there at all of the different secondary schools. You're also supposed to see your buildings to accommodate the new trust into TVET. It is not all of our students who have that academic inclination. And we must be able to reach those who want to specialize in the area of technical vocational education. But we're even taking it further than the secondary schools. At the primary school level, you're supposed to start learning certain competences which will help you so that once you go into that area, you already develop those competences. A well thought out program. And so when you hear persons in here, Mr. Speaker, saying 
that the government isn't serious. This, it isn't a reflection of that. CDB was here recently. They were at my office. We met. They said to us to start putting a listing together of certain equipment which we are going to need for the start of the new school year because the program is being rolled out. I have no doubt that they would have also met with the Minister of Education for Nevis and would have had similar discussions with him. So that is forthcoming, Mr. Speaker. We are looking, Mr. Speaker, at making changes to the curriculum at the very primary school level. If you were to read this particular document, Mr. Speaker, it notes, or perhaps I should say, recommends certain changes within the curriculum. One of the things it speaks to, any future develop, curriculum development activities in SKN should ensure that the learning needs of students are the primary focus. And the first question to be asked in this regard is whether the range of subjects, the vertical components provide students with all the skills, knowledge, values, and dispositions they need to become successful citizens of their country and indeed the world. If the answer to this question is no, the country should determine which areas of cross-curricular learning the horizontal elements should be incorporated within the curriculum structure. It goes on. Should the Ministry of Education adopt this recommendation, it is critical that broad consultations are conducted so that areas of high priority specific to SKN are identified. <coughs> because of its small geographic size and population, the country may consider, for example, that national identity is a key priority or because of the emergence of a gang culture among the nation youths, there may be a need to focus on appropriate civic behavior <coughs> and civic responsibility. It is important that these priority areas be determined within the social, economic, and the political context of St. Kitts and Nevis. That is a recommendation that we are taking on board. Starting to teach certain subjects at the primary school level, subjects related to culture, so that our people from a very early age recognize who they are, recognize their own self-worth. We believe that when you put a value to yourself as an individual, you in turn will value the life of other persons. You will value the life of other persons. That is what this government is embarking upon. We intend to change the culture. The point has been made that this crime situation is one that we inherited. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't begin in February of 2015. It began long before that, from six murders back in 1995 to a high of 34 murders, I think it was in 2011. By the time we took office, Mr. Speaker, in 2015, you had some 10 murders already committed in the Federation. Not so much, not so much. If I'm wrong, correct me. But some 10 murders already committed by the time we took office in 2015. That is what we inherited, Mr. Speaker. And we are not shying away from the problem. We are not pretending that the problem does not exist. If we were shying away from the problem and pretending that the problem does not exist, we would not have increased the budget for national security to some $72 million or thereabout. We would have decreased the budget and pretended that there's no problem. But we can't shy away from it because people in St. Kitts and Nevis, they're living it. And they expect answers from the government. They expect answers. And we are trying to provide the answers to deal with the crime situation. Just about every single thing that the police has asked for. 
the police has received. I don't think that cabinet has met more with any other ministry or department than persons from the police force. Always having meetings with persons from the police force, evaluating what it is they're doing, finding out what additional resources are needed. Mr. Speaker, sometimes you got cabinet Monday, next thing you get a message to cabinet again some other day in the week to meet with members of the high command. Saturdays, Sundays, late evening, meeting with members of the high command from the police force. We recognize there is a problem. We are not burying our heads in the sand. We are not saying there is a problem, but it's going to solve overnight by itself. In this particular piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, it is not the solution to the crime situation, but we are saying to those who have been caught with illegal firearms that you must pay the price after we have given you all of the necessary tools. We have provided training, whether through the PEP program, the STEP program, or we have made the TIVET program available in the schools. We have given you the SAFE program at CFBC. We have provided monies at Development Bank for young persons interested in going into business. We're giving you all of the necessary tools to develop yourselves and to live a life that is crime free. We're doing that for the young people, giving them opportunities. And we're saying, having given you all of those opportunities, having given the necessary resources, if you still decide to go that way, then you must pay the price because you're wasting the resources, you're wasting the opportunities which have been given to you. Honourable member, time has expired. Mr. Speaker, I request the next 10 minutes. The question is that the member requests, has requested an additional 10 minutes. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Giving them all of the resources and having given them the opportunities, having given them the resources, if they squander it and decide instead to go to crime, then you pay the price for it. You know, someone sent me a message today. And you know what the individual said? The sugar industry closed back, I think, in 2005. Yes. And when the industry closed, there really was no plan, no exit plan, after the closure of the sugar industry, Mr. Speaker. There really was. On the order, Mr. Speaker, that is not true. You know, I mean, maybe the person is not informed. But I don't think that the Informers. member should just simply accept what he has Informers. been told. What was it like? Because there was a comprehensive plan, one, um, on exit, two, on training, and three, pursuing a path for alternative economic development of the country, clearly outlined. In fact, I'm sure it was brought to this parliament. So he can't make those kind of statements. Well, Mr. Speaker, if there has been a plan, the fact is the, fact, the, 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 the plan has failed. I know. The plan has failed? Yes. That's not so at all. The plan has failed. Um, I accepted <laughs> your point of information. Um, if the member, but the member now, the member now has gone on. That's his opinion, so he, he has that right. Yes. I don't agree with that. Mr. Speaker, the industry closed for the most part. The line stood there. Some persons chose to begin planting marijuana. And so that for them, Mr. Speaker, has become their way of life. 1200 poofed. Pardon? <laughs> and so, Mr. Speaker, you had that culture. Did that culture develop, Mr. Speaker? I don't agree with that. I said, Mr. Speaker, a large part of what has happened 
is the failure of the former administration. The failure of the former administration. Sugar industry closed. And for the most part, you had persons being left jobless. Persons being left without any form of employment. That's not true, mother. I don't expect you to say it's true. But Ain't much things that'll come in here and say it's true. The facts are there. This parliament has the record. Remember? I don't expect you to say it's true. It? A court said you're a stranger to the truth. A judge. So I don't expect you to say it's true. Failed the people, the young people in particular, Mr. Speaker. And then come in here to pretend to so care about young people. Come in here, come talk about the prison. As if the prison just built. As if the prison just get overcrowded. Prison ain't just built. Prison ain't just get overcrowded, Mr. Speaker. All of a sudden you're in a position now. You care about the prison and the condition at the prison. But what did you do when you had the opportunity to do something about the prison? What did you do relative to the prison when you left the millions, the hundreds of millions of dollars in the treasury? Nothing. But you know, care about prison and reforming prisoners. St. Paul's Police Station, I have the pictures here, dilapidated right around the corner from where the former Minister of National Security lives. Right around the corner from him, dilapidated. You can't believe you had police officers occupying that building. And then you come in here. You're concerned about police officers and the welfare of police officers. Mr. Speaker, action speaks louder than words. Action. The sick out report. The sick out report? Remember, for number one, say you heard it. Action speaks louder than words, Mr. Speaker. And your actions should have spoken to the public that you had a concern about law and order in this country. The actions didn't reflect that. But at this point in time, perhaps you have repented. You have repented. You feel that you have ideas to offer. Bring the ideas forward. Bring the ideas forward and let us work together to deal with the crime situation. If you're serious about it, bring the ideas forward and let us work together to deal with the crime situation. It is an invitation that all of us over here, we have offered. An invitation we have extended. An invitation that we are serious about. Bring the ideas forward and let us work together in unity to deal with the crime situation. Mr. Speaker, as I said when I began, sometimes our reality is shaped by our own personal experiences. I can speak, Mr. Speaker, to the use of illegal firearms and the effects of such in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And so if for no other reason, Mr. Speaker, I wish this bill safe passage through this honorable house. May it so please. Stay up to date with news, programs, and activities of the government with SKNIS. Like us on Facebook. Listen to us on SoundCloud. Follow us on Twitter. And watch our videos on YouTube. Connect with us today. SKNIS, St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service.